between the wisdom passed down by ancient healing traditions, anecdotal experience, and modern clinical trials, one thing is clear. Mushrooms are medicinal powerhouses. And I finally found a brand, a product, a company that I feel really aligns with all of my research and understanding when it comes to the medicinal properties of mushrooms, and that is alchemy mushrooms. They grow their mushrooms in California on organic mushroom farms. They keep the whole mushroom in their supplements, and they actually blend mycelium and fruit body in their mushroom powders and capsules to give you the best of both worlds. You can learn more at Alchemy Mushrooms. That's A-L-C-H-E-M-I, alchemymushrooms.com. Use the discount code MUSHROOMHOUR for 20% off your order. Alchemy with an I, mushrooms.com. Hi there, welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have the privilege of speaking with Mark Williams, founder of Galloway Wild Foods. Through his work in the wilds of Scotland, Mark hopes to share his passion for foraging and the delicious and nutritious food that we can all gather for free in the wild. In so doing, Mark's goal is to restore vital connection between humans and nature, increasing our intimacy with the natural world, in ways that are beneficial to our own physical and mental well-being and the health of ecosystems of which we are part. He teaches about the full range and depth of wild food and foraging, including plants, fungi, seaweed, and shellfish. These practices take Mark across a diverse range of habitats, from high mountains through forests, hedgerows, urban settings, and down to the coast. He covers all areas of foraging, including traditional and modern food uses, health and nutrition, traditional and modern medicinal uses, survival and bushcraft, wild booze, and lots more. Mark, thank you so much for joining us on the Mushroom Hour. Well, thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. Well, I'm excited. I've I've devoured your body of work here over the past couple of weeks. It is extensive. It is detailed. Uh, it is hugely inspiring. You've done a lot of great educational posts and videos. So yeah, I'm just excited to dive into it all. But inevitably, as we get started, I always like to hear what inspired your journey into foraging in this relationship with the natural world. Yeah, I suppose it, um, <clears throat> my, my family were very outdoorsy. You know, we, we used to like climbing hills together. I have early memories of climbing up um, mountains with my dad, getting very wet and cold. Uh, having <laughs> socks on my hands and shivering. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I kind of, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I really took to that and, and kind of enjoyed the outdoor life. But in terms of the actual kind of wild food and foraging, that was not on the family radar at all as I grew up. It, you know, we were very conventional, you know, growing up the 70s and 80s. It was, you know, a lot of uh, the microwave was <laughs> featured heavily. And you know, <laughs> don't get me wrong, my, my, my mom and dad are good cooks and everything. But, you know, there was it wasn't that. They weren't looking to, towards that thing. And, of course, back then there was a lot less focus on provenance than, uh, than we have nowadays. So, you know, everybody was kind of waking up to that. Yeah, so I kind of got into food, into the foraging side. Well, my first spark was was mushrooms. Um, that's the thing mm. that really got me excited. I think in a way I probably fell in love with the hunt, first of all, rather than, you know, it was a finding, it was a search, it was that anticipation and working out the clues that really, really excited me. And kind of developed a little bit later, you know. Yeah, and so I was probably about sixteen, seventeen, and got you know I started getting excited about it. Well, and that was something we talked about before the show is how mushrooms end up being this entry point for people to explore the natural world, get into all kinds of foraging. You know, it is this interesting gateway. The endorphins and whatever ancestral DNA we tap into when we're out foraging, mushrooms seem to be somehow like a focal point to get people into that. Absolutely, yeah, and I, I just there's so many strands to that, but I think a lot about what really connects people to to make excites people about fungi, and then I'm from there foraging, and certainly one of them is that kind of mystery of fungi when you don't know what when you don't understand about mycelium, they are this mysterious, exciting thing that appears, and then for me the the early spark with that was I mean they weren't on my radar at all, but I was working a summer job in a restaurant, and of course in the UK we're quite famously microphobic culture here so it's not really on on a wide radar even for outdoorsy people or it certainly wasn't back then look at the kind of 80s here 
And then uh, I worked in this restaurant, and the chef had this book called A Passion for Mushrooms by an Italian chef called Antonio Carluccio. Now, I don't know if he's hit the radar over in the States, but he was a lovely kind of plump, jovial Italian chef, and he was just so passionate about the the, the portini, you know, and, uh, and he had a great book. It was actually a recipe book, and it was mostly recipes for wild mushrooms, which are kind of fairly meaningless at that time in the UK to, you know, the vast majority of people. But in the back, he had this little mini mushroom guide. And I think if I, if it hadn't been that book and the way he described the mushrooms in that little tiny guide, he only had like 12 commonly eaten species in the back. I don't think I might have connected quite so quickly or, you know, maybe I've got there in the end, but, you know, instead of the kind of dry field guide, and I mean, even Roger Phillips' book, it's a fabulous mushroom guide, but it's quite, you know, specific and quite scientific, if you like. Whereas Antonio's book was like, oh, I, I used to love foraging chanterelles with my third wife, and I love the way she eased them from her mossy bed with her tender fingers. And, you know, just you could just kind of smell it and feel it. And it was just such a great book. And um, I need to I need to find it, actually, again. I seem to have lost it. It's maybe buried somewhere in the house. But just uh, that really sparked me, the way he described them. And um, and the chef I worked with at the time, we were working split shifts in, a, in this restaurant. So we would actually have two or three hours to kill between shifts. And we were surrounded. I, lived, I grew up on this beautiful little Scottish island called Arran, just off the West Coast. And between shifts, we were surrounded by all this forest. So we thought, rather than do naughty things like have a beer, <laughs> we'll, we'll actually try and do something healthy. So we would go out and started looking for, for mushrooms. So that was the kind of, that was a spark for me. And uh, when, I, when I teach nowadays, I always try and remember that first year or two when everything was a death cap. You know, that could probably be a death cap. You know, that, that could be it. And I try and kind of, bring that to mind just you know when when you're teaching people who are new to that world just how kind of worrying that is and how, how everything kind of looks the same at that stage and yeah we had great fun and uh, yeah a few incidents as well <laughs> well it's funny that your connection was through this kind of more tangible guide about the storytelling and the experience and i find the same thing i really connect with books that have this element of narrative or storytelling uh, Eugenia Bones' mycophilia comes to mind as she tells the story of her own journey into foraging for mushrooms, and it's highly narrative. I mean, there's plenty of science mixed in there, but that kind of thing always, I think, makes a fantastic connection. So definitely going to look up the book you mentioned. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, but what's unique about Scotland as a mushroom habitat? Because I think of, you know, this windswept, rainy island which may be perfect for mushrooms, but you know what's unique about Scotland as a mushroom habitat and what mushrooms are you finding there? Yeah, well, I do laugh. I think that the west coast of Scotland and the climate of the west coast, even though we're a small country, the west coast of Scotland is a fair bit kind of drier and wetter than the, than the east coast of Scotland. So especially in the west coast, I feel like it's kind of autumn for about eight months of the year. If, if mm -hmm. We get about three months of spring and we get about eight months of autumn, and then we get a couple of weeks of proper winter and a couple of weeks of proper summer. Uh, so, you know, we have a we have an eight-month chanterelle season some years, so, or a minimum of six months, depending if we're early or late, you know. we start They start in kind of late spring and the right through it, still picking them in December kind of time. Madness. So it's wet and it's damp. It's like a maritime climate. And we have a lot of forest. Uh, and that's not all natural forest. We, you know, there's beautiful natural ancient oak woodlands, uh, the valley where I am in southwest Scotland, the Fleet Valley's got all sorts of natural stuff. But we also have vast areas of, of planted forestry, you know, uh, Sitka spruce plantations, things like that. And of course, as mushroom people know, you know, it doesn't have to be ancient woodland. Uh, these, there's amazing bycats from these monoculture plantations that, that uh, dominate kind of quite big areas of, of the west coast of Scotland. So, um, yeah, it just seems like, a, I suppose it's a natural fit to... It's, a, it's definitely a fungal environment. Yeah, this thing, things want to want to grow and want to rot and, and and so on. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of microclimates in there that would be perfect. And I love that you just pointed that out about plantation uh, tree plantations because that's something I've heard now in speaking with foragers from Ireland, Scotland, and England is that there are and it appears that Sitka spruce is kind of one of the prime plantation trees that they grow there are great groves essentially of porcini and <laughs> other mushrooms that go along with these tree plantations so something for all the uk foragers out there to think about is those big tree plantations also end up being kind of wild edible mushroom plantations absolutely and i mean in, in fishing they talk about bycatch you know they go to catch one thing 
and uh, and they come back when they they'll have a load of crab as well in their in their creels or, or whatever they're doing. And I see I see the the, the fungi as, as an amazing bycatch of this essentially pretty not not great uh, habitats, you know, impenetrable to most people uh, uh, plantations. And uh, I think we're very lucky that Sitka spruce is so mycorrhizal and so you know it's got diverse partnerships and lots of good et stuff in there as well i actually um one of the few other kind of parts of the world i have gone mushroom hunting is in the yukon in uh, north america uh, canada and um up there they have these vast natural kind of coniferous forests huge and beautiful but they only really have about three or four types of of fungi certainly when i was there in the area that i was in near near white horse and um yeah it's like just didn't seem even as diverse as what we have in a, in a Sitka spruce plantation here. And it, it seemed when I was speaking to the locals, they said, yeah, no, that's, that's about right. We get, we have three edible types and that's about it, <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, definitely feel spoiled here. And, uh, you know, of course the diversity in the, in the, in the ancient woodland or the, or the more natural woodland, should we say is, is extraordinary as well. But definitely if you're going, if you're going looking for food, I, I advise people to start in a plantation really. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes we have to work with the landscapes that we're given. And I guess with a culture as ancient as Scotland, you know, kind of the storied history, maybe that's my romanticized American version of Scottish history. But I think, you know, there's definitely an, an ancient culture there. What kind of wild food traditions are already present in Scotland? And today, what does that wild food community look like? And I realize that this may be something where, hey, folks in the Scottish countryside don't think of foraging as this kind of special trendy activity. It's just what they've always done. But what what does that wild food landscape look like, if you know, both historically there in Scotland and then today? Hmm. I think we do have to be careful as kind of modern foragers. I suppose I'm kind of getting to be one of the older parts of the modern school of foraging now. But you definitely have to be aware that there is a kind of a an undercurrent of people who look at all of us with our Instagram photos and all of that, but in, as, as if it, and they're all going, they think they've invented something new. We've been foraging forever, you know, and, and, and there is this long tradition of, you know, actually going out, but it's, I've got to say, I have, I've had people like that on my teaching events and they start off with a little bit, not grumpy, but just kind of a little bit kind of, okay, what are you going to show me then? You know, and then normally they, they're like, oh, oh, you can eat that. Oh, you can eat that. You know, and, and I'm not, not showing off about myself here. This is like any, foraging teacher nowadays is I think we've really diversified out from those traditional things like elderflowers, sorrel as most people's on most people's uh, radar. You know, a lot of people kind of grew up eating this sour leaf that they can no longer remember the name of. So there are there are traditions there, but I would think more on the, the wilder west coast of Scotland where there's a crofting community, just for maybe a listeners from the States don't aren't so familiar with that concept, but a croft would be like a a small holding, I suppose, would be the closest you have to it. So just a hard living of maybe a few animals, a little bit of rough land, because the land isn't, it's not good agricultural land generally on the west coast of Scotland. It would be a subsistence kind of existence. And foraging would have made up a part of that kind of um, existence. But generally what you hear in the, you know, from the old crofters that it's still about is that would have been at times of real hardship. They would then go mm. down to the shore and pick things like silverweed, a lot of them are passionate about some of the seaweeds like carrageen, dulse, because most of these crofts are kind of coastal anyway. So it would have been part of an overall diet then. But generally, even in that community, from you know old old timers in that world I've spoken to, normally a lot of the foraging stuff was in times of extra hardship when the crops had failed or something like that. So it feels to me that there's not like a, a massive kind of a more modern tradition of, of foraging. Of course, the ancient, uh, you know, hunter-gatherer ancestors, of course, they would have been uh, out there and it would have been rich pickings. Uh, yeah, but that, that's definitely got largely lost. And I think this this modern movement of foraging is like a rediscovery of some of that really ancient stuff that's kind of got buried in the mists of time. And then a reconnecting with that sort of stuff in the last hundred years, that traditional post-war kind of foraging scene. And then this like real explosion of gastronomic interest because all the chefs are getting into it and food scientists and, and all of that and everybody's looking for the new thing. So that, I suppose there's those three layers uh, that, it, that it seems to be built on. Well, and then for your own personal pursuit and passion for foraging, what is it about this practice of 
foraging wild food that resonates so much with who you are? You know, is it that gastronomic interest? Is it maybe self-sufficiency in the idea, you know, that noble idea of living off the land? You know, what is it for you that makes foraging resonate so much? So I think for me, a big part of it is just being out in the wild and just connecting with places, you know, feeling intimate. I mean, I still think of the 35 years ago now, 30 anyway, I found my first chanterelles. And I still remember that exact tree. I could go to that tree on Aaron where I found it. And I suspect the chanterelles would be in more or less the same place, you know, and that's just magic. That's like, that's like a little cathedral to me. That's, that's, I mean, I'm mm. a religious person then. Um, Generally, but in a spiritual sense, like that, those are the places that I feel anchored and special. And it doesn't have to be some magical hidden glen or something like that. It's just a place where you've got this extra deep layer of connection because you've eaten from it. You've you've observed it through the seasons. You've you've been there, going there for twenty years, and you're really deeply connected to that bit of land. And and I, I think that is that's my kind of source of it. Everything else is a bonus. I would probably be doing that anyway if, you know, if, if I couldn't kind of eat them or if it wasn't nutritionally good for you or something like that, I'd still be wanting to really deeply connect with all these uh, these places. And I suppose the other part of that, so there's those, that familiar side of foraging, which is lovely, and then there's that mystery side of foraging. So what am I going to find? And I think that touches back to what we talked about earlier on with mushrooms, especially when you're near the start of, of kind of learning about mushrooms. It's it's all a bit of a mystery and a surprise. And even when you kind of have really good experience about the kind of habitats where you might expect to find things, it's always, there's too many variables, aren't there? It's just too complicated to really work out. Plants are a bit predictable that way, where fungi are just just magical. And I think that's the, the special, my specialist places are all associated with fungi. Yeah, I love that idea. And it's almost like this concept of paradoxes that are so alluring. I love that you just brought out this. There's familiarity with foraging of both places you're familiar with, of tapping into, as you said, a tradition that our ancient ancestors would have all engaged in. You know, foraging is the domain of all humans. So it's something hugely familiar to us on one level, but then there's this mysterious aspect on the other hand. So there's something alluring about that paradox brought together in one activity. I think you just elucidated it beautifully. Uh, something else you brought up is the coast. You know, another huge foraging habitat you brought up is the coastline. Uh, and you mentioned a couple species of seaweed. And But how much of coastal foraging is still kind of this untapped resource? Because I think a lot of people are familiar with foraging mushrooms and wild plants, but I don't hear as much about coastal foraging. Uh, so do you see that as kind of an untapped resource or how is that relationship for you developed with foraging the coastlines for wild food? Oh, um, it's, it is an immense uh, kind of more untapped resource, I suppose you could say, and uh, a vast as well when you start getting into seaweeds, but also coastal succulent plants that are essentially the aristocratic grandparent, great, 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 great grandparents of all the broccoli, kale, all the things that we're planting and growing in farms now. They, they grow wild around the coast, around Galloway. Wow. So, I've got to say, I mean, I've been I've been eulogizing about fungi, and that, that it will always be my first foraging love. But I've got to say, being on the coast, like, oh my goodness, uh, yeah, on a spring day, and there's this like vast, vast amount of of greenery, like deeply nutritious, deeply de delicious greenery. I'll give you a couple of examples. There's where the seaweed, the dead seaweed, builds up at the high tide line in about April around here. These little shoots come through. And this is a orach, O-R-A-C-H-E. It's a, a, a relative of fat hen, I suppose. This is a coastal variety of that. But it, it starts as these little succulent shoots. And within about a month, there's this like hedge of like just, just titanic quantities of greenery that come up so quickly. And it's super, especially in spring, it goes a little bit bitter in the summer. In other areas, we've got a plant called sea kale which is like purple sprouting broccoli, I think is probably how most people would connect with that. Uh, just an amazing kind of purple little shoots, of broccoli florets, it has flowers that taste of honey. It's just exquisite and the most beautiful thing. And, um, and when you go to actually forage it, you know, people worry that foragers will take too much, but I guarantee anybody who's connected with this plant is just like standing in awe, admiring, going, wow, you're beautiful. <laughs> you know, and then nibbling little bits of it, you know? And then, um, I'm very lucky in Galloway. It's there are places around the UK where it's under pressure, 
and it is um, you know protected in some areas. But we have some vast areas of a three mile stretch where you can literally walk along just above the high tide line. And every every two paces, there's this enormous plant of food and succulents. So in terms of thinning that abundance, um, it's just an extraordinary. I'm just skimming the surface there. And then if you go on to seaweeds, wow. Yeah, that's just so exciting. And they're, they're definitely up there with fungi for me because just that elemental quality with seaweeds of it's where rock meets, meets sea. Mm. The actual feeling of being there, especially on a wild day with a waves are breaking in you've got to plan ahead and be a bit careful but i'm picking them the flavors are just miraculous yeah but anyway to get to your question i think i would say seaweed in particular is especially around the uk is such a maritime nation i mean this bit of scotland that i'm in on the west coast has a longer coastline this tiny little island bit of our small island has a longer coastline than the whole of france because it's really it's like fjords you don't really notice that it's like these thousands of inlets and sea locks and stuff like that so with this vast coastline full of seaweeds and people are just starting to reawaken to that their potential and their deliciousness and of course the country and that's most um kind of has a strongest tradition of that is japan mm. and actually look at the the kind of physical geography of japan it's actually a, quite comparable to scotland you know maritime island nation lots of sea and it always astonishes me how how the uk has become so divorced from its from its uh, seaweed heritage uh, when it's got such you know like such an abundance of that you know i mean some of these things have been eaten in the past but there's nothing like the tradition that they have in japan so really interesting the kind of cultural dynamic that has made us made it weird you know most people in the uk when they talk about eating seaweed will say oh yeah it's a bit chewy you know it's like because they don't know how to use it and uh, i guess that's where we come in yeah yeah well, exactly we need mark to show us how to reclaim the seaweed heritage. And when we're talking about nutritional and medicinal values, you know, I know that's something you discuss with all manner of wild food, but when it comes to seaweed, you know, what kind of nutrition or medicinal aspects of this plant are we able to, to connect in with? Well, gosh, there's uh, so much with seaweed. Um, it's probably, I've heard it described as the most heavily mineralized vegetable on earth. And of course, that's a bit of a generalization because not all seaweeds are the same. It's a bit like people talking about mushrooms as if they're one thing. Of course, they're not. They're, right. they're just as diverse as the plant world. Um, and uh, so there's all sorts going on with seaweed. But I'll give you an example. Like dulse, uh, it's a lovely little kind of red seaweed. It's got, it tastes, it's marketed now as vegan bacon because uh, it's got this really meaty, umami kind of flavor. And it's just really rich, but it's really, it's, it's almost nutritionally complete, I've been told. Oh, that's incredible. So, I mean, that, that word superfood is thrown around so much, but I, from what I've heard of what you're reinforcing, seaweed feels like it is a, a real superfood. Yeah, yeah. I mean, lots lots of other benefits as well as that kind of nutritional balance. So um, quite high in iodine, really good for balancing the, oh, I get a bit out of my depth from the medicinal side sometimes, but really good if you've got an overactive thyroid for regulating the thyroid. So right. loads of loads of great things. I had for my lunch today. My probably my favourite one is what we in the UK call lava, L A V E R. The Latin name is porphyra, but in Japan they call it nori, and that's kind of across the world where it's most commonly thing. But the, the right. tradition in the in the UK is to collect the seaweed and you cook it for hours and make it into this paste and mix it with oatmeal and then fry it, and that's called lava bread, and it's a Welsh actually a Welsh classic dish. And uh, that is probably my favorite thing. I make tons of it a couple of times a year and freeze it all in little patties and just take them out and re reheat them. And it's just like when you eat it, you can just feel the nourishment. You know, you can, it's like eating spinach or something like that. You know, you can just feel it doing you good as you do it. You know, it's remarkable. Yeah, well, and you're hinting at this Welsh classic dish. So clearly there is a heritage with seaweed we can tap into. You know, something that I know a lot of people are becoming more cognizant of, especially when foraging in urban areas, but really in any area, uh, mushrooms in particular, because they soak up things from their environment, is considering, you know, the potential for contamination or the potential. Do you have to worry about anything like that with seaweed? That's been my only misgiving about going because the California coast, we get tons of seaweed washing ashore. But I've always thought, you know, can I trust 
the water source? Is it is that something you're ever concerned about with seaweed? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, just like any other thing that you're picking from the wild, you, you definitely got to engage with uh, that side of things. I mean, where we are in the in Galloway here in the southwest corner of Scotland, across the Solway from us uh, in northern England is uh, a, a nuclear power station called Sellafield. Oh, terrific. Yeah, so and so there is like higher radio and I get I get contacted by a an academic about every three or four years and they do they're doing surveys of people who are using a lot of things from the wild and they're doing this for the nuclear power people so they can check who's consuming what and you know, so yeah, no, it's definitely on my radar. Now I'm kind of what I tend to do because seaweed you, you can harvest a year's supply of seaweed in a couple of days on a good tide up the west coast. So I tend to I certainly get some of my seaweed from from around Galloway and Solway, but I'm aware of that. And I actually kind of use places, wilder places off the West Coast, which where there's no issues around that at all. And and you actually tend to find in these in these richer kind of wilder waters, the seaweeds do better. It's a little bit counterintuitive in terms of we think about plants, and most plants do well in sheltered habitats uh, where they're kind of you know getting lots of sun. Whereas you definitely find the best seaweeds or well, much. Again, not every species is the same, but a lot of the really good species to eat do best in these kind of wild kind of headlands uh, where they're getting blown around. And it's all about nutrient flow, of course. They're not, they're getting the nutrient flowing past them. So that's, I tend to wait until I'm doing that. And we do kind of kayaking trips up the, up the west coast of Scotland where we paddle and forage at the same time. And uh, I tend to wait till one of them and maybe the day after I'll just go out myself and stock up on a year's supply of seaweed from various locations. So, yeah. But that is the joy of seaweed. A bit, it's a bit like, you know, with, with fungi, you've, you you might hit a year's supply of sep in, in, a, in a plantation in one day, might you? Right. And it's like, yeah, it's a bit like that with seaweed, except you kind of, it's more reliable, much more reliable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it feels like these coastal environments are really another frontier of foraging. And I think we can learn a lot from cultures like Japan uh, and from cultures there in the UK Isles. You know, there are folks like yourself who are kind of pioneering this resurgence of interest. And that's why it's on my radar. And I think for folks, any coastal environment, you know, where I am in Northern California, anywhere, we have access to some of these same plants and seaweed. So I think it's this frontier that that we need to reconnect with because when we think about sustainability, which is always a concern I know for people about mushrooms, but also wild plants as sustainability, you know, making sure it can come back for future generations, you know, the coastal, especially seaweed comes to mind. Some of these coastal resources just seem to be, you know, hugely abundant at this point and, and eminently more sustainable. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I maybe didn't fully answer your last question about pollution. So um, in the UK, I don't know about in the States, but in the UK, we have a, a SEPA in Scotland, Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. And they have it okay. down in England. And you can actually just approach them, go onto their website, and they report on the water quality for any given area. So you can actually get warnings if there's like a red algae bloom, they will flag that up. If uh, The funny thing about them is quite a reflection of our society, though most of the most of their environmental reports about the water quality of the sea is about bathing. It's not about whether you're going to get your food there because nobody really, these people sitting in offices kind of assessing the data on these things aren't really connected with that world and it's not a big thing over here. Whereas lots of people want to go to the sea and have a swim on the beach, you know? So it, most of it is like what the bathing water quality is like. And of course, the standards are going to be a little bit different um, if, you, if you plan to eat stuff from there. I don't know if they're going to be higher or lower but uh, anyway uh, so yeah there's there's definitely a little bit of research to do but the information is is out there and i also think a bit of instinct you know once you get a little feel for seaweeds is you, know, you just don't go next to a harbor a busy harbor or you don't go kind of near like large urban areas if you can avoid it and you, you kind of go further a bit further afield so yeah kind of instinctively kind of feel for that so so i'm, asked, I'm now answering your previous question and i've forgotten what your what your last question was no, I think you're bringing up a really important caveat, and this is something I'm trying to do even for mushroom foraging, is have that instinct and have that awareness about the surrounding environment where you want to collect your wild food. Just be cognizant of potential pollutants. So I, I love fleshing this out a bit more because it's very easy to go on social media and say, yeah, go forage wild foods, look at all these great wild foods. But there is that important caveat of considering potential environmental contamination. Not that that should scare anyone off, but it's something to be mindful of. I think you've touched on an important thing there as well. I think there is, problem might be too strong, but there is an issue 
with some of the sort of surge in social media foraging or cyber foraging, I call it, where you know people are showing all this great stuff, but you know on Instagram or Twitter or even Facebook, you know you, you can't put enough information to really awaken to tell everyone what they really need to know about that plant. So you see a lot of kind of partial stuff that's that's great, and I'm, and I'm totally up for that the connection that that brings and the inspiration. But it's like really important to put in a link or some you know here's some further information because you, you you can't really give give the full picture. And I and I know attention spans are quite short nowadays yeah. we're all kind of flicking to the next thing but i think we just have to swallow it and say look let's have you know let's not worry about getting masses and masses of followers let's just go deeper into this stuff and let's spend half an hour doing a proper kind of thoughtful post or you know i would say to people i mean i kind of mentor quite a lot of people who are starting to be foraging teachers now and i'm like don't spend hours putting stuff on social media write something or make a really good film for your website and just link back to that. And then when you when you are out Instagramming something, you ping out a picture and you add a link to it. And, and then there is all that information that people really need access to. So yeah, it's a little bit of a bugbear of mine when you, because we can give the wrong idea. You know, I do it myself. It's like, oh, look at this amazing basket of mushrooms I've got. But nobody talks about the four days that you went out and you didn't find a single mushroom. Uh, <laughs> we know that's what makes it so magical. But of course, you know, so we're giving... We can easily just selling people the wrong idea that this is just about going out and getting, and uh, they don't see so much of that kind of uh, going out and thinking and and walking for miles and miles. So I think that's our job to stay focused on that. Well, and I think that practice of creating, you know, what you're talking about is kind of these really well sourced reference posts or reference videos that have that depth of information. And I think something that is the output of that is also it greatly deepens your own appreciation. I mean, you may have been foraging that for years, but there's still so much you can learn about it. And I'm thinking of that quote you gave me before the show from Roger Phillips about his great mushroom book yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what that process did for him that I, I, I'm forgetting now, but what did he say about writing that great mushroom book? <laughs> I was chatting to Roger Phillips who wrote the seminal, I know you've interviewed him, but uh, on, on this show and, um, he wrote the, the seminal book on mushroom identification in the UK. It's like, if you like, David Aurora is the man over there, wasn't he, for many years, you know, and uh, but, but right. you know, Roger, Roger's the man, and you've chatted to him. Hopefully people have listened to him on your on your podcast. He's, he's lovely. And uh, But it was this beautiful photographic ID guide, and, it, you know, it, this was written in the 80s, early 80s, late 70s even, right, right about then. There was no other guides like it at the time. Anyway, so I, I was lucky enough to kind of go and hang out with him a little bit in the New Forest a few years ago. And I said, like, yeah, I've got to ask you, what inspired you to go out and do your, do that book? And he said, oh, well, that's quite straightforward. I realized that I knew absolutely nothing about mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. You know, that, that disciplined process of having to write a well-resourced post or a book, that is really what teaches you. And I'm talking from this place of not having done that myself. Uh, so, you know, my, my podcast is my attempt to flesh out some of these ideas. And of course, that forces me to research the topic that I'm going to be talking with people about. But yes, I think that's such an important element and something you do so well on your website. You know, if people go to GallowayWildFoods.com. You're going to find a library of information about foraging that really goes deep with both mushrooms, wild plants, coastal foraging gives, you know, scientific context, cultural context, of course, humor mixed in, recipes. That's kind of the body of work that I hope to aspire to is kind of what you put out in that form. Well, thank you. And I'm glad you like it. And uh, yeah, thank you. But what, what I would say from my point of view is that started as a little blog. I mean, I was totally non-tech, but my, about 10 years ago, my friend he was quite techy. He said, "Oh, you should you should blog about all your foraging, Mark." And it's like, "Oh no, what, I don't know what's blogging." And barely knew what the internet <laughs> was. You know how quickly we've moved, eh? But he started, and, and I, I realized I love I've always loved writing, and I realized when I wrote about stuff, I had to think about it because you have to organize your thoughts, don't you? And I mean, when I'm when I'm teaching, and some people come and they take really meticulous notes when when you're going. I mean, I've never been that organized, but that actual process of digesting something and transferring it into another form is how you really learn. And, for me, I mean, I don't make a lot of videos, partly because there's a lot of people a lot better at that sort of thing. You know, we all have our medium, but I really love writing in a selfish way as well, because that's like, I'm going to write this, so I'm going to do it right. I've got to organize my knowledge. And I'm like, I thought I knew this about it, but actually I'm going to research that a little bit more. And that process of writing and recording and 
starting almost like a diary, isn't it? And uh, is is really, I think it's just a powerful way to learn. I, mean, I know everybody learns differently, but it works for me for sure. Yeah, well, and it just creates this useful trail of breadcrumbs through every aspect of foraging that later on people can always reference back to. And it was actually your newest post that was one of the biggest eye openers for me. And you had a, a post you made about conifers and seeing the flavorsome attributes, the culinary uses and potentials of conifers. You know, so that was something that absolutely blew my mind. So if we can, you know, because every mushroomer knows that we've talked about Sitka spruce, you know, every mushroomer knows the value of understanding what conifers you're dealing with when you're hunting mushrooms, but I've never seen the conifers themselves as this source of wild food. So talk a little bit about how we can develop a relationship with conifers to reap the benefit of amazing flavors and natural cocktails and all other kinds of things that you make with them. Well, I suppose my, my way into really thinking about conifers for more for flavor than for food, I suppose. You know, I don't think of them uh, nutritionally as such. They're not, it's not like eating a vegetable. It's more like flavor. But we can, I can talk about a few of the elements. Uh, you know, they've got lots of different edible parts and usable parts. My way into that was was through booze. And my, my two big passions in life are booze and, and foraging. And uh, I've been very, very lucky in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, this huge upsurge in botanical gins, and everybody wanted to know about right. what can I use in my gin and you know and all of that. So of course I got to hang out with these distillers, and of course in turn they would hang out with really good bartenders, and then you start to learn their, their techniques and classic cocktails and and the, the relationship. It's a bit like working with good chefs as a forager. Same with really good bartenders or mixologists. I don't think that word is really valid, but yeah, I think they call themselves bartenders. Um, mm. Is like that the forager provides this like amazing new raw flavors, raw materials, and they have these incredible techniques to draw out those flavors. And quite often they'll analyze those flavors. And it's a great chef I work with called uh, Craig Grozier, who cooks beautiful food, and he's really into the science and the chemistry of it. So like working with him down the years, you know, he started and we were working with a gin brand together. You know, he he sort of unpicked the chemical constituents. It's like what he was like. Why does spruce tips work so well with gin? And he's like, oh, it's because it's a conifer. And of course, the most important conifer of all is is juniper, without which you can't have gin. Although some modern gins tend to leave a lot of juniper out, but you know that's where the name comes from. So like that's another conifer. There's a big flavor overlap, and you start to look about the relationships between the chemical compounds. And you start to get this like lovely little kind of jigsaw of where the wild flavors fit into the all the other stuff. So that that's been my kind of like passion and, and privilege and, and job for quite a few years now, and uh, mm. picked up lots of cool things. And in particular, infusing, extracting those flavors of conifers, which are kind of like it's like a library of citrusy flavors from grapefruit through to lemon and apple skins and limes and also all of these amazing things. And that incidentally is because they share these compounds, these terpene compounds, um, limonene and pinene in particular, with, with citrus fruits as well. So that's where the overlap comes. It's just a joy. So that's the kind of boozy flavor side and in, infusing into cocktails. And, you know, my, my, my standard cocktail is a, is a gin, and then I have a gin infused with noble fir needles, and I mix the two together to spice that up. And then I make a kind of like Campari, like a, a bitters out of three other conifers. And it just comes out like really bitter oranges. It's crazy. So you can kind of make a Negroni. I mean, I do too much of that, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I get to do research. <laughs> I mean, it opens up this whole new world. And, you know, I do know some people that are into kind of the botanical cocktails. And it really is this almost alchemical process of figuring out what flavors in nature and, you know, sometimes they impart something different when you actually leave them in alcohol to infuse. It's different than maybe the fresh tip of that different conifer. But what's the basic process of making one of these cocktails? I mean, are all these terpenes just alcohol soluble and you just have to leave in alcohol for long enough? Or what are the basics of, of making a botanical cocktail? Well, I mean, I suppose that what we're talking about now is extracting flavors from things. And there's, there's right. kind of four or five basic ways of doing that. Most obvious, cup of tea, you know? All you're doing infusing infusing botanicals in boiling water, and that water's breaking it down and lifting out the flavors and so on. Another way is uh, kind of maceration in alcohol. So, you know, you're using the alcohol to draw out the kind of volatile compounds that alcohol kind of draws out. So that's where you can just 
steep things in gin or in neutral spirit like vodka or something like that. Mm. Uh, and you can make a syrup or you could infuse it into vinegar. So you've got sweet and sour. Uh, you've got alcohol, you know. So, so all those, they're like those basic pro processes of a syrup or a vinegar or a boozy infusion or, um, you know, all of those things together give you all those flavor elements that make for any good balanced drink, don't they? Yeah, it's, sweet and sour is, is the ultimate thing to balance. Bitterness is really important in drinks as well. And then the booziness with, with any kind of extra flavors you want in there. And so, so you're just basically, the best way to do any, any kind of cocktail and to, go to, to head into that world is to look at classic cocktails and say, what could I use that does the same job? You know, so if you smash up uh, spruce tips or even even mature spruce needles uh, with sorrel or apple or sour apple juice twist into your into your cocktail. So it's not really rocket science. It starts to sound really complicated. But all you need to do is just make some syrups out of things that you like that are around you and make some vinegars and maybe mix the syrup with the vinegar. Then you've got a shrub. Put some stuff in booze. Leave it a few months. If it's no, no good, leave it another few months. And you know, and then I mean, just I've got a kind of crazy storeroom, and there's stuff at the back that I haven't looked at for years, and eventually it works its way to the front, and then you're like, oh yeah, that's good now, yeah. And there's always little surprises, so I get to I get to kind of reforage all these flavors. So it's about, I think it's about being playful, and I suppose also being aware that you know you are extracting the chemical properties of plants. You know, you're, you're kind of making medicine, especially you're making tinctures. Alcohol can pull all sorts of things out as well, so. You need to kind of have an awareness of safety, and uh, you know. So I kind of yeah. in my in my article, you know, obviously it's not just about not knowing that something is not a poisonous plant. So if you're working with conifers, obviously you have to avoid yew trees, but there are some that are a bit more allergenic that you might want to avoid as well, and just stick to the easy stuff and, and so on. So lots to think about, but you can start with the basic steps. Well, what I'm struck by is you're laying out a process that gets you into this whole world, yeah, of just flavor extraction that could lead you into different sauces and syrups, yeah, tinctures, cocktails. I mean, once you understand the basic principles and maybe more importantly, know what flavors you're looking for and what wild plant can safely bring those flavors to whatever you're making, you suddenly enter this really fun and creative world of being able to make so many new things and combinations. You know, it's kind of, I, I always talk about how especially with mushrooms, kind of the second half of foraging is what you do with what you found, right? You know, you have yeah. to go back and you have to usually prepare it by dehydration, pickling, freezing, do something to extend the life because you can't eat that year's worth of seps you just found out in the sickest spruce. You have to preserve it somehow. And this is kind of taking that even further to novel ways of preserving and using aside from just kind of what I what I consider the basics you know this is kind of going to to a little bit of an elevated place that offers again a much more broad perspective or array of uses for some of these wild goods essentially yeah foraging is is nothing if it's not a springboard for being creative you know you, you might go out looking for things but what's lovely especially when you get more comfortable with plants which are everywhere you, you just go out and what, what says hello? And then you connect and you say, all right, hi, come back with some stuff. And like, now what do I do with it? Rather than the classic, the traditional kind of Western attitude to it, I suppose, or modern attitude maybe, is like, oh, I've got this recipe. I need to go and get X, Y, and Z to do that. Now, right. There's nothing wrong with that, but to actually respond to the stuff and, and to do that is it's just like recipes are a bit overrated, you know? <laughs> You know, it's like it's like somebody else's business plan or somebody else's taste or somebody's trying to push, you know, and, and it's great. There are some simple combinations that are that are kind of important, but then they're, they're very seldom complicated. They're you know, they're pretty straightforward. And and really after that it's it's kind of up to up to you to kind of find what works for you, I think. And I did want to tell you about uh, one of my favorite things to make. So one of my big kind of hobbies with plants is making vermouth, which obviously uh -huh. ties really well, like you know, bitter fortified wine, I suppose you would call it, aromatized wine. And I fortify it with all sorts of plants, but then I thought, well, surely mushrooms are going to work in there. So I made a mushroom vermouth with like eight different types of fungi, and uh, it's really good, really good with whiskey, very, very good with whiskey. And uh, Mind-blowing, yeah. using mushrooms in cocktails. Yeah, 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 yeah. They have this kind of, you know, uh, beefsteak fungus works really well. A friend of mine down in the in forages down south, uh, Peter, he, um, 
he raved about it for years and I was like, that's crazy. But he just takes beefsteak mushrooms, slices them up, puts them in vodka and leaves them for at least six months. And it comes out like a rosy port or something like that. You know, like boozy, like a bit like slow gin that we make up here. They're quite fruity and quite tannic because, of course, they grow on oak trees. So they're, they're bringing the tannins from the oak trees into, into the booze. So I use a little bit of that. Um, a little bit of uh, chanterelle infused in vodka is lovely, brings out some of that fruitiness. Sep is always amazing. A few ones that are probably slightly more party-ish, if, um, <laughs> just a tickle, a tickle of the more exciting um, uh, psychedelics, just for my personal use, you understand. <laughs> personal and, uh, educational use, always. Yeah, and maybe a bit of truffle on top. And yeah, and some medicinal ones, chaga in there as well, bitterness from birch polypore. And, uh, you know, the, the, the combination is lovely. And it actually goes best of all with American whiskey. I'm sorry to say it, in Scotland, the home of home of amazing Scotch whiskey. But with um, American bourbon whiskey and uh, mushroom vermouth is incredible. Yeah, that's a little bit of sacrilege for for a Scot to, to give any kind of deference to American whiskey. <laughs> it has its place. <laughs> it has, yes, it has its place. But you just opened up another whole perspective of using mushroom extractions in cocktails and i've actually heard something similar with the idea of syrups you know where you bury something in sugar and then over time it gradually makes that nice syrup i've heard people do that with chanterelles and different mushrooms and then use that syrup in you know either directly as a flavoring or mix it with granola or something so it opens up whole new potentials for how we can treat mushrooms because a lot of times on the show i talk about freezing or drying or pickling or you know those kind of standard preservation techniques, but using them as an extraction is such an important thing, I think, to add to the repertoire, the foraging repertoire. Absolutely. And what I would say is to any forager, whether, you know, however far into it, if you go and hang out with a really good cook, your chef or somebody who's, or a really good bartender who's really into flavor, and then you go out foraging with them and you show them what you know, and then hear about their techniques, because that's how you pick up those really cool techniques for for grabbing those flavors, how to lift best lift those flavors. I mean, some of the chefs I work with are they go into so much meticulous detail, and they're amazing. You're never going to do this at home, or <laughs> I'm not. Right. I'm quite lazy, but you, you know, you can definitely pick up gems and nuggets. It's like, well, I'm not going to make it quite as nice as he does, but that's his full time job making food, you know. But you, you can definitely get gems of wisdom and, uh, and and little techniques for getting the best of flavors out of things. So yeah, hang out with it. It's, it's a perfect synergy. Uh, a chef and a, and a forager. Absolutely. And do we have a Mark Williams Galloway botanical gin in the works? Have you ever thought about making your own brand of whatever kind of botanical cocktail? Well, it kind of helped a lot of people at the early stages of connecting with their stuff. But I've, and I suppose my shelves are full of things that are infused into gin, but I'm not into consistency. So I'm never going to be a producer of one thing. Well, that is actually one thing I'd love to have a go at that with, but I would need to be working with somebody who's really organized and, you know, but um, what I want to do is like everything I make is different, you know, so that, that mushroom vermouth I made last year, or well, like, I'm going to make it different this year, you know, and, and it's going to, it might be, is it going to be better? Well, maybe I'll enjoy last year, years better, but I've learned something on the way. And I, I just can't be bothered with consistency and all this, like measuring things out really finely. It's a bit of that, bit of that, taste, taste, taste. Got to be a little bit careful with that when you're making vermouth because you do a lot, of, a lot of tasting, and before you know it, it's <laughs> yeah, you're done. <laughs> right. So you're more of the mad foraging scientist R and D team uh, that kind of brings forth these amazing ideas. And we've talked about then kind of the culinary and the drink uses, and you hinted at some of the medicinal. Where do wild foraged plants, mushrooms, you know, seaweed, where does that feature in terms of your medicinal use? And this can be an, a topic that can be contentious for people. There are people that dismiss medicinal qualities as, oh, that's a lot of hand-waving. And then there are people that obviously have had hugely powerful experiences and are ardent believers in medicinal qualities of wild foraged plants and mushrooms. W where do you fall on that spectrum? And do you use any of these finds for any medicinal purpose? I, I do use lots of things to support my health. I am a long way from being a kind of health nut, if you like. Uh, you can see me, I'm definitely, you know, you know. Yeah, and for, for me, I think that the most important thing is to eat biodiversely, you know, so it's not about going and finding X superfood or something to cure that or something, you know, it's about like 
you know, I look out my window now, there's, I know there's like 300 things I could pick within 10 minutes walk of my house. And, a li- and I'm not saying I'm eating all of them every day, but over the course of a year, you're getting that, like real bi- biodiversity. Some of them aren't particularly good for me. You know, I, I eat quite a few things in some of the foraging guides. It was like, oh, don't eat this or don't eat too much of it. But uh, other things are extremely good for you. And it's, it's about dosage is the thing, isn't it? And it's about like having a biodiverse diet, which is what we kind of evolved to have rather than, you know, there's some statistic that I think we, you know, we used to eat on average, you know, humans would evolve to eat hundreds of different types of plants. And now we get 90% of our nutrition from six different plants. You know, that's something along those lines. You know, it's, it's, it's so it's, for me, it's about being diverse. But in terms of like what I take, I mean, the other thing is I don't get ill very often. So people mm. uh, people ask me a lot about, you know, I mean, I, I can kind of tell people this plant is has been traditionally used in, herbalism to do this and like oh do you use it and i was like no because i've never had shingles or you know i've never had piles or whatever you know so i it's, it's a bit unlike food for me in terms of it's not actually experiential to me uh, mm-hmm. you know all the stuff i talk about food wise i've eaten them and i can you know say well actually you can eat it but i don't particularly like it but you know you try it the medicinal stuff is a bit more kind of feels a bit more theoretical to me because i do feel like I don't especially need it. I don't get ill. I've never very lucky that I've not been ill. What I do have, I take every, pretty much every day through the winter is uh, either Chagar tea or Burt's Polypore tea. Probably alternate between between the two. And I throw turkey tails in when I'm making stock pots, you know, like boiling up beef uh, deer bones or something like that. Yeah. And uh, just little things for me that are kind of like flavor and that's probably going to be quite good for me, but not in a organized or sort of i don't have a kind of a regime or anything like that you know so yeah well i think you're bringing this perspective that's so powerful about wild foods is just engaging the practice of eating these diverse ultimately nutrient rich foods because they're pulled from usually healthier vibrant you know wild environments just by eating those over time consistently you know that is medicinal quote unquote in itself you know, and that's one of the big insights that I got in speaking with different herbalists and different people who are into the practice of using certain medicinal wild plants and mushrooms to treat certain symptoms. Almost the ubiquitous advice is what you just described was that, well, you just really need to eat a diverse array of these plants and mushrooms over a long time period. And that's the only way you're going to see benefit, you know. I know there's this explosion here in the States of like medicinal mushroom tinctures and those kind of things, which probably do have, and the research shows they do have medicinal qualities, but taking those, you know, for a week and then kind of forgetting about it. And then oh, a month later, that's not going to have the same effect as consistently having some wild food in your diet that has some of those same medicinal qualities. So I think there's that overused adage, food is medicine, but I think you really elucidated that well, how wild food, a wild food diet can be medicinal and healthy. I, I think so. And uh, and also, you know, the mental health benefits of just getting out and being out there and, and looking and connecting and doing, you know, doing by doing, not doing by by talking about doing, you know, but, but actually it's, it's just something deeply practical about it. And I mean, I think the big thing as well is it's kind of easier to live in a beautiful kind of, you know, mixed habitat, you know, glen, there's loads of forests and hills and the coast's not far away, you know, I think it's really important. This this doesn't have to be done in the countryside. There are there are stuff around us all the time, and it, it may be less. I mean, I I surveyed our valley, and there's about 300 things in within 10 minutes walk. You can, I've done the same in parks in the middle of Glasgow or London, and there's still 50 things. And mm. of course, not everybody can go get them, but you know, like you know, they are going to get under a bit more pressure if foraging kind of uh, gets more popular there. But you know, a little nibble here or a little taste there. Like so many people come to me and they're, they're really actually super worried about like what what's my impact going to be? And we've been we've been kind of like conditioned now because we, we have made such a mess of the earth, you know, as a species. We've been conditioned to think that actually touching nature at all is the problem. It's not. It's about our disconnect, isn't it? And so yeah, I think that there's just really powerful things we need to need to kind of really work on there. Just support people and encourage and nurture them and. You know, let's get foraging into schools. You know, why why are kids not taught about you know what they can eat, what they can't eat in school? So that's the big picture, I guess. And that feeling of connection, 
to the land in an era where we're increasingly, I mean, disconnected even from our physical bodies, much less the land of which we're standing on. It would seem to be such an important balance. You know, as we get more into this technological era, we're going to need to also bring it back by making sure we're connecting ourselves tethering ourselves to to the earth, if you will. So I think that's going to be ever more important. And of course, in this era of lockdowns and people not getting outside, it would seem to be more important. How has your educational work shifted? Has it taken on any greater import? You know, how, basically, how has this whole practice, including educating people, changed during this past year? of lockdown and even more kind of disconnection from, from nature. Yeah. Um, it's been amazing, actually. Um, I've kind of, it's been a challenge for everyone, but of course with the challenge, you can make good discoveries. And my big discovery was, you know, we got shut down this time last year, really, didn't we? Lockdown yeah. over here anyway. And it, you know, like this one, one of the lovely thing, all the foragers I knew were all like, Oh, what can we do? How can we really help people? You know, there's such a nice bump, such a great vibe. You know, generally foraging is just full of nice characters. And well, my thought was like, well, I'm just going to do online mentoring, and I'm going to do. So I did. I rolled out this kind of free. Book me for a session, and we'll we'll just talk for 40 minutes about what's important to you, uh, what what you've got in your garden. It could be anything, or your questions about foraging. And I got everyone from people who'd never even tasted a bit of sorrel to people who are actually what writing a book about foraging to people who were wanting to start teaching about foraging and ev everywhere on that on that spectrum I had chefs and also some people got in touch from the states as well I was I mentored a couple of people from the US and there uh, that was interesting I was like well we'll need to see where you are it might not be that relevant to it if you're in Arizona we're going to have a slight <laughs> more in my quota um, but it, that was a lovely as well and it was such a positive experience because I love going out in the woods we're going to take like, 12 people out in the woods or on the coast in person and that's my standard kind of event and we cook and we eat and we learn about the plants and it is fabulous but you, you are kind of divided between 12 people and there, there might be that person there who's really quite advanced and has really really in-depth questions and there's somebody who's you know just a novice and is almost at that point of trying to find permission to forage you know so mm. you naturally spread out and in a one-to-one -one chat on you know like we're having now you can really drill down, and we have it's incredible that the changes in people. I had you know, somebody in Edinburgh who was going out with his kids, you know, and just to kind of extend their walk, and they went from nothing to actually munching on cow parsley, which looks very like hemlock to you know, most, most people are terrible in a few weeks, you know. And now he's just like, you know, and that's not because I'm amazing, it's because he had a one to one with somebody, you, you know, and that, that kind of mentoring thing. So I think. That's been really positive. And what I've done I've sort of going forward, I mean, this is my full-time job teaching about this as well. So I've structured that so it's like you can book a slot. And it is a bit more structured now. It's not all free, but I, I do do kind of, you know, more accessible sessions as well. And that's just been really powerful for me and just really lovely because you kind of get to build a relationship with somebody. You know, they'll, you know, have a, quite a lot of people come once a month, you know, and they'll book a slot once a month and we'll just... If it's led by them, they quite often ping me a load of photos of stuff they've been puzzling over, and uh, you know we can really go into the why and the when and focus down. So it's uh, it's been really really positive, and uh, yeah, I'm about to kind of relaunch that again for this year, just because I'm cancelling events that I had scheduled for March, you know, physical events that I had scheduled for March. That was great, and uh, also webinars. So I started doing some webinars. I did three fungi webinars last autumn, and uh, I'm just writing a seaweed one now. We'll do lots of different webinars. One about plant chemistry everything so that's that's the plan not as much fun as being there with people and being in a wood and smelling the mushrooms or flombing mushrooms in a deep in the forest somewhere but um it's certainly i think in terms of learning i think it's a really good way to go yeah i mean what a great output from all of this madness if you were able to develop kind of a new offering that may be as impactful, maybe even more impactful in some ways in, in terms of the reach you're able to have, the specificity you're able to offer to that person's situation. That's really awesome. And I love to see that how, you know, different wild food educators have been able to adapt, which you think something like foraging is, or I've always had my best experiences learning in person with groups where you're really able to make that connection. So I'm always impressed with people like yourself who have adapted and are still able to offer really powerful information, even over the digital medium. Uh, I think that's going to expand the potential of 
foraging education that's really going to catapult it into this new stratosphere in terms of reach and availability when people can start doing digital and online offerings. Really exciting. Yeah, yeah. We'll see how it goes. And uh, well, I mean, it's, I'm enjoying it, and uh, that that's the main thing. And people are coming back and enjoy, and they're they seem to be getting plenty out of it. So it's a very nice way to teach. And I can always go out and walk myself and. I've got. I've just got a new phone, so we'll be shooting a few more videos and things like that going forward, and you know that more instant kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, we're we'll, we're definitely going to be pressing on with that for sure. He can have the photos and videos, and you've already done the work, so you can now reference back to your more in-depth writing and webinars. So really, really cool. And where can people connect with you and your work if people are interested in signing up for one-on-one mentoring sessions or webinars? Where can people find more about your work there at Galloway Wild Foods? Yeah, so, well, that's it, um, GallowayWildFoods.com, my website, and you'll kind of, from there, you can launch into the, you can see on the menu, there'll be, you know, mentoring or guided walks or webinars, and, uh, you know, I do quite a lot on social media, just in terms of just trying to share what I'm up to, but also reference, give that reference back to something else, so that would be Instagram, um, at Mark Wild Food, Facebook, Galloway Wild Foods, Twitter, at Mark Wild Food, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and actually, social media has been a great way for to see it down the years. I started on Twitter about ten years ago, and you know, even that that Twitter was a bit of a weird frontier at the time, you know. But right. it was an amazing time to connect at that point, and uh, I just met you. Suddenly, kind of met a handful of other foragers. There was only a tiny amount, uh, certainly, that we connected with over in the UK. But it was really exciting to know there were other people who was as geeky, and and that explosion has just been incredible. On social media, I suppose it's very visual, isn't it? Uh, you know, like look at these amazing plants, and you know, revelation to see how that's 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 happened. I like to think that educating about wild foods, maybe just nature more generally, which inevitably people who get into wild foods end up learning tons about just the natural world and ecology. And I think having that kind of content on social media is kind of one of the best uses of the medium. Is these little snippets of especially things like mushrooms, which are so ephemeral. They're almost made for social media where you can capture them and have this snippet of something that you may never find. You know, I think having that kind of content balances out some of the inanity and, you know, the cat memes and different things. It's something like really with substance that you can bring out into the real world because not much in the social media box can you bring out and use in the real world necessarily. So... Again, I think it's that all important as we move more in the digital space to have offerings that kind of pull us back to physical reality. You know, and I meant to ask, because you are one of the central figures in the group, uh, tell us about the growth of the Association of Foragers and maybe any future plans you have with that group. Because, you know, it's something we don't really have formalized here in the States that I've always admired there uh, in the UK is this group of people into food and foraging coalescing around that into this kind of loose, you know, guild or association, but tell us a little bit about that group and some of the future plans that you have working with the association of foragers. Well, it, it kind of started as a bit of a joke you know, for me. Anyway, I, I wrote an article and I mean, it was basically, a, I mentioned dandelions and horror of horrors. I'm a forager. I'm not that excited about eating dandelions. You know, they're just the wrong kind of bitter for me, you know? And I, so I kind of jokingly said, I'll be, I'll be, drilled out of a guild of foragers for saying this. <laughs> you know, Terry Pratchett, all those Terry Pratchett novels, and they've got, you know, the guild of yep. assassins, the guild of shopkeepers and all, yeah. So um, there's a gin uh, distillery over on Isla that I work with. Wonderful, really exciting, uh, vibrant people working there at the time, and, and they were just really enthusiastic about, about foraging, and they had some money, and uh, I'd been working with them for a couple of years, and they were like, do you want to get some more foragers to come and play? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So like they paid for, like I basically got to invite all my kind of cool foragers I would like to have hung out with. And I invited like five people, a couple of them I knew sort of in the flesh already, but most of them were just like guys down in the south and stuff like that. And we, we had this kind of wild few days on Isla at the, being put up and looked after really well by, by the guys at Brucladi Distillery. And we kind of partied hard and foraged hard. And there was this kind of revelation that, Oh my God, we all get on so well. And like, we've been looking for you, you know, I've been like, you know, because there wasn't that much foraging vibe about it at the time. It's not quite like it is now. And we just realized that we're not rivals because there was other foraging teachers there who, you know, we're all kind of in the same world, 
we weren't we weren't rivals. We were just kind of like part of the thing, you know. And it was just just incredibly exciting. Anyway, one of the guys is a nice guy called uh, Andy Hamilton, and he wrote this great book called Booze for Free. You should talk to him one day. <laughs> he's not so much for me, but he's uh, he's good at uh, plants and uh, certainly the booze stuff. And um, Andy was like, yeah, and we, I think we just chatted about it that weekend. It's like, oh, the Guild of Foragers, kind of jokingly. And he just set up a Facebook group like a week later and said, right, we'll be the Guild of Foragers. And then we found out that a guild is apparently supposed to be uh, like it's something to do with the Queen. You have to be authorized by the Queen to be a guild. Anyway, so ah. it became the Association of Foragers, group affiliation. And then we put feelers out, connected with a few more through that, and then said, right, let's meet up in Bristol, south of England. 30 foragers turned up after about a year down, down in Bristol. And uh, do we, And the question was, do we want to be a thing? <laughs> that, was, that was all it was. Because, you know, foragers are kind of crazy, quite anarchistic, chaotic, uh, somewhat disorganized, <laughs> uh, resistant to authority, don't like um, uh, pyramidal organizational structure, you know, all that kind of stuff that right. is quite damn right. But we, we decided we want to be a thing. So we've had this wrestle, real, not a wrestle, but... Um, you know, we formed, we wanted to be a thing, we felt this great kind of shared purpose, and then we've got loads of great ideas, but not that many people who want to sit in the front of a computer to actually make them happen, <laughs> you know? And uh, <laughs> so a lot of it has been mutual support. We've grown, we've only about 120, but the, the idea is it's people who teach about foraging or earn some kind of income from foraging, whether it's supply, something like that. And we had quite a lot of US members, but kind of, you know, the, the big thing we have is one meetup a year where we all go out and hang out and have like 50 crazy foragers running around the Scottish castle, you know, kind of gutting beer and all of that and making cocktails. And yeah, it's just amazing. And then, yeah, so we've got a good vibe and we're sort of building that and slowly kind of getting to a point where we're a little bit more organized and we want to sort of reach out. And, you know, if you film it, there's, there's some theory about how organizations like this work and it's forming, storming, norming and then performing we, we've kind of formed and stormed a bit and now we're kind of trying to norm some stuff and get some stuff set up so we can actually kind of reach out a little bit so yeah we, we haven't done as much as we've talked about but who has really yeah and we've got a few projects underway one's quite exciting it's kind of like i tend to say pet project of mine but i've been kind of heavily involved in it and we came from a trip to finland i had and then over there they have a, a wild food accreditation scheme uh, so people get a little stamp book and they go out and they get say right you know this 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 mushroom you've done your kind of test with a with a tutor and and uh, then they can supply those 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 kind of mushrooms and they, some plants as well and kind of came back with that thinking well god you know I'm the last person to get interested in extra bureaucracy or placing any barriers between people and foraging that is like the opposite of what I am but we noticed a real need from chefs and uh, wild food the businesses that wanted to use wild ingredients but weren't sure. And what about the hazard analysis? What about chemical safety? You know, so if we're actually serious about connecting with the abundant wild foods and getting them into our food system, then we kind of gonna have to go down that road and talk to uh, the Food Standards Agency, things like that, and conservation. So what what I've been doing in the last year is just building a framework for that, but also at the point now, we've just got some funding to develop it further, is to bring in, this is pointless if it's just made by foragers. So it has to be made by foragers, conservation organizations, chefs, businesses, um, food standards agency, and all of these voices, and come up with, like, what do we think is, like, really good information to know and share and what's really important about this species. And the big thing about it is, I think the most important thing for me is it's species-specific. Mm. Like, Catch all rules for foraging just don't work because you, we all know it's not the same to go and pick uh, hawthorn leaves or elderflowers in it, you know, where there's billions of them. It's not the same as going and picking, you know, knocking chagger off trees where, where it's not very common, you know. So we, every, every kind of assessment or any kind of evaluation that we have around it or accreditation will be specific to that particular species. So you just get your box and he's like, yeah, he's done a level one in chagger or level two, or level three. And, you know, and and the other thing, I think what we're trying to recognize in that is that nobody knows everything about foraging, you know? Right. You know, I know people who could spend, give you a week's course or just on birch trees, and they're, they're not particularly interested or don't have any particular knowledge of seaweeds, 
you know, but they could be incredibly in depth and, and fascinating about that. So why should there be some big general test about the accreditation about foraging? So it's got to be species specific. So that's what we're kind of working on at the moment and trying to just, you know, not alienate anyone because this is not about saying you don't know enough, you shouldn't be doing that. It's about saying, you know, here's some good information. Here's a way you can show people you've done that. And if you want to supply, then this might be a benchmark that chefs start looking for to show that they've done their risk, you know, their hazard analysis and it's coming from somewhere that's sustainable or that kind of stuff. So just building infrastructure in that. It's a big project, but it's uh, yeah, it's kind of like, oh, well, we're started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we're going to have to spend time behind the computer. Well, you pointed out that, you know, a lot of the foraging community is kind of this decentralized dissident network of kind of highly individualist people who I know, like myself, kind of hesitate when we talk about codifying anything or making any kind of structure. Yeah. But I think what you're talking about is really the next step that's going to be needed to make the process more attainable for more people. I think there's basically, I think there's going to be net benefit out of that because in the United States, there are several mushroom licensing efforts taking place both on the East Coast. And I think it's starting to matriculate across the country. But one of the common critiques is that it's one big general test that can't possibly cover all of the intricacies of certain species. You know, they'll have some general statement like there is no poisonous lookalike for chicken of the woods, whereas in Pennsylvania and parts of eastern Pennsylvania, there actually is. Yeah. So I like the idea of making it more species specific, which it's interesting that that specificity makes it more inclusive because suddenly you could have loads of people who know chanterelles well enough yeah. to be able to get the chanterelle certification and provide that to restaurants. So I really like the idea you're putting together there. And of course, always bringing in a diversity of voices is going to usually lead to the most stable path forward, especially in the UK, where I've noticed there's this undercurrent of conservationalism and foraging as kind of like two ends of a spectrum. And there seems to be some contention there. And I've had different people explain it to me as well. You know, Britain's used a lot of its wild land. So now there's this strong impetus to don't touch nature. And I think the only way to kind of diffuse that is do what you're saying, bring everyone to the table you know, really get sensible about the information, the facts about how these different organisms reproduce, about sustainability of different species, that differentiation, again, being hugely important, and then creating this system. I don't know if you even want to call it licensure, because I know there are a lot of people who have problems with just that idea. But, you know, I think that is a necessary next step. So yeah, I, I laud you for being willing to take that on, because I said, yeah. Most folks I know would be hesitant and want very little to do with that. So, yeah, well, believe me, I have been, and I constantly question, like, is is this right? And I keep inviting, you know, I, I keep circulating it within the Association of Foragers and now to some other organizations. I keep asking for people to tell me what's what's terrible about this approach. You know? <laughs> so I can say, okay, let's abandon it, and I can just go to the woods and get away from the computer. <laughs> but actually, you know, that there is a demand. We're not forcing anyone to do anything. This is voluntary. You know, this is always going to be voluntary. So it's going to be species specific. And it's not about you can't do this, but it might come to the point where if you want to supply a restaurant, that chef will will just ask you. And so, you know, the chef's not going to buy this stuff from you unless you've got some kind of thing. And maybe that's, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, totally, I'm totally up for people telling me, you know, we have thought about the difficulties, but I'm totally up for listening to more and uh, we'll hopefully tackle them as we come along. But we can build a cons consensus, you know. There's, I see a lot of like this idea that conservationists and foragers are kind of having a battle. And it's one of those things that we have so much more in common than we have different, you know. We are about native connection. We are about getting deeper into it. And we just start, slightly do it in different ways and they're more tactile, probably a little bit less scientific as foragers. But we need to listen to them, but they also do need to listen to us because foraging is happening. And uh, if they don't listen, they'll, they're they going to be making rules in isolation, you know? So it's about trying to build that consensus. And I've got some, there's some, I should also say that the situation in Scotland is a little bit easier than it seems to be in England. We have different access laws in Scotland. I know over in the States, everybody thinks it's all one thing, but Scotland is fairly different in lots of ways. And uh, maybe, maybe even more so governmentally, if, we get independence, but that's another, another debate. But in terms, in terms of the access in Scotland, anybody has a right to roam on any land at all in Scotland. 
and in so doing can forage for their own personal consumption of plants, shoots, fruits, berries, mm. things like that. You don't need any permission. If you're doing it commercially, you should have a landowner's permission. Now in England, they have a trespass law, and I know in the States, you, it probably varies across, but you know, it's a bit more serious. You know, there's people with signs and guns. And when I was in the Yukon, you know, you kind of, yeah, just uh, treading a bit more carefully. So, so it's a slightly different movement. In a way, Scotland is slightly, partly because we've got more space, slightly better placed than a lot of the conservation organizations have. And I've seen it in the last 10 year, years, like through working with them, they started off deeply suspicious. And every time I talk to them about foraging, they'd be like, oh, what, 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 what about this? And now they're actually paying foragers like me to come and deliver foraging walks to show people how to do it. So they have absolutely got up here that foraging is that, that access point for, for a lot of people and that deep point of connection and profound intimacy with, with plants. And they're getting that up here. We've, there's still work to do. And, you know, it's partly because it's a bit more crowded in England or different personalities and, and things like that. So there's work to do, but fingers crossed. Yeah. Well, and this is a huge step in normalizing foraging. If people know that there is a codified set of standards, you know, when you're talking about buying wild food somewhere or seeing people engage in the practice to know that there's some established codified standards always makes people more comfortable with things. Yeah. I think we've seen that in so many. So as I was ruminating on it, I was trying to think of a way that I could poke a hole in this. No, we need more decentralized anarchic, but you know, I think this is going to be a really necessary step. And what's nice is it's people like yourself. It's people like the association of foragers. You know, when you're kind of the one starting that conversation, it lets you guide it to a place that avoids maybe some of the worst case pitfalls of what this kind of administrative bureaucracy could entail. You know, Mark's not going to be the one who implements the institutional tyranny, if you will, <laughs> over foraging. You know, it's good that you guys are kind of at the helm helping guide the conversation. Yeah, I, I very much, uh, yeah, I very much hope I won't be involved in that one. Yeah, yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> but so we'll, we'll see where we get and uh, maybe we can talk again in a couple of years and see where we've got to and uh, yeah, it's exciting and interesting and challenging and all of these things. But I think if we're just serious about about power of, you know, some of these hyperabundant things, you know, nettles and dandelions, and, you know, why shouldn't these things be harvested and sold and, and in our food system? Their impact is considerably less than even the, the best organic farming practices, as long as they're thoughtfully harvested. So, you know, it's about putting some sort of benchmark on, on what is thoughtful, considered harvesting. So, yeah, we'll see how we go. Let's see how we go. Well, I think you guys are at the forefront of, of kind of the next step of normalizing foraging into the culture. Really, really exciting. Well, you know, I was going to ask you what your future plans were, and I think you've just given us a pretty full slate <laughs> uh, when it comes to more classes, doing this work with Association of Foragers. Is there anything else, any books in the work, any maybe certain area of foraging you're about to release a uh, you know, a post on or reference work on that you're really excited about, anything like that? Well, actually, I get asked about a book quite a lot, and, and I have got a book half written, and uh, I've also got my website, which feels like a few books. Yeah, it um, is, yeah. I know it's not quite the same thing. I'm, I mean, I, I've been in talks with publishers, and I just kind of lose the thread. I think what I need, if anyone's listening who is a, was it, a publishing agent or something like that, I think that's probably what I need just to kind of, deal with that stuff and get the, get the deal set up because it's kind of written. And uh, yeah, so the, the book is in, in the works, but actually the book's a bit set. You know, I know, I know the book is a good, really good benchmark. You, you, don't, yeah, you don't publish a book, a properly published book, unless you've really thought about things. And, you know, it's really, and we all want to write one. You don't get rich from writing foraging books. Right. It's about, you know, having, having your book out there. And that, that's great. And I'm, I'm up for that. But um, actually they're not very flexible. I mean, you know, the book I would have written 10 years ago is really quite different from the book I would read now. And, and what I love about my, about writing all this stuff, giving it away for free without advertising on my website, is that it's just really accessible. So it feels like it feels like a really nice thing to do. But I could go back and change it. You know, I'd go back and there's posts that I wrote and I add to them. And rather than like adding in hundreds more plants and just trying to cover as many plants as possible, I'm now going back to stuff that I wrote about eight years ago and adding in more ecological notes and things I've noticed from like, oh, I've been harvesting it in this spot for so long and there's no, it hasn't changed anything or, you know, and, and so you can actually build on a website that it's quite hard to do in a book. 
but I am totally up for the book thing. I just need to get organized. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do love that idea though, that the, the website is an ever evolving tome of your knowledge. So if you want to read the book by Mark Williams, go to GalwayWildFoods.com. And that kind of is the book right there. Yeah. Well, and if anyone's listening, is a publishing agent, here you go. You've got, you've got your next great book on Scottish wild food foraging waiting for you. Well, Mark, as we wrap up, I'll ask you the three questions I ask all my guests that always have great answers that I would have never thought of. Uh, and the first one, sometimes the most challenging, but it is, what is a mushroom that you love and why? And this can be for edible purposes, cocktail purposes, just you know, pure tactile or visual enjoyment, but a mushroom you love and why? I've got two in my head because I, I knew you were going to ask. This we can do two. Then. Okay, okay. Well, Hen of the Woods, my tacky, Grafolo from those. I mean, oh my goodness, isn't it just the most beautiful thing? Amazing to eat, beautiful to find, and just so exciting to find. And and here, I don't know about you, we have like mass tears for it almost. So like, I, I only found like one on a shovel board last year. The year before that, it was like an amazing year. They were everywhere, and it was like, <laughs> wow. You know, so it's like the big game hunting of mushrooms for me. And, you know, with their medicinal qualities, their beauty, their, their, their flavor. Delicious, I mean, yeah. It, past them, and there's, and there's a lot of strong competition. But uh, getting away from the kind of edible, there was one that fascinates me, and it's, um, it's called, um, well, there's two related fungus. One feeds off another. I, I kind of love them because they – show the ingenuity of fungi and and the complexity and their interrelationships and one is called hazel glue and it, it grows on hazel trees and what it does is as the branches as the twigs fall down out of hazel trees they'll kind of get caught in the in the full in the in the other branches of the hazel trees and then the fungus glues them in place okay so it forms this little crust and it will hold them there so they don't drop onto the forest floor so that it doesn't have to compete with other fungi i mean how cool is that so that, that that one's called the uh, hazel glue. I just wrote wrote down the Latin name in case anybody wants to um, look it up because it might have a different name in the states. Himanachete corrugata, probably not pronouncing that correctly. So so that's amazing, but and that's quite common near us. But there is another fungi that parasitizes that. Oh no, I'm onto free fungi, aren't I? And it parasitizes the hazel glue, and that's called hazel gloves. Hazel and gloves. It looks like it looks like a rubber glove kind of around the tree, and that feeds on the hazel glue and it's quite rare the only place i've found that is the west coast of ireland in the borough in this amazing kind of limestone area um but it's like i just love finding the hazel glue because it's just kind of like the ingenuity of fungi and it's almost invisible and you have to kind of shake the bits of the hazel tree to find it and the hazel gloves because they're kind of really quite scarce but also like a Fungi on fungi action is always exciting, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Fungi on fungi action is always exciting. And you've just illustrated like this amazing fungal ecology that you find in almost every ecosystem, but just examples of fungi doing, you know, adapting to novel food sources or moving to a different place on the trophic levels to where they don't have to compete as much, parasitize. I mean, that relationship has it all. So fantastic answer. And of course, we'll link to all these fungi, assuming that I can spell and find it. We'll, we'll link to all these fungi in the show notes as well. And then, you know, a much broader general question uh, that we've referenced a couple times, but what has this deep relationship with fungi? Maybe I'll expand that to say fungi, wild plants, you know, seaweed, coastal plants. What has this relationship you've developed with all of these different wild foods in your area given to you you know how much maybe richness spiritual perspective what has that brought uh, to your life it's, it's a big big thing it's, it's i think it just adds another dimension you know to just being out in na out in nature it's just another layer and you know i used to do loads of hill walking and stomp on and you know like you know hill walking or biking and all that all those kind of you know active active things and you're kind of racing on and that is wonderful you know up for up for all of that but it's the slowing down, isn't it? It's the it's the kind of sauntering and looking really carefully at that tree or trying to find a bit of hazel glue or are oh, there buds there? And it's that kind of slowing down, it's just that profound kind of connection with places that, that have another layer of meaning other than just being beautiful or pretty or, you know, and I think I think that's the thing for me. It's kind of like you get to see the world in an extra dy dimension and it's, you know, it's fab. Yeah, well, and I think I have to say I quite like my food as well. So yeah, the flavor the flavors come up there too. But that, that, that comes first. Yeah, we we can't dismiss 
the culinary abundance that's been brought to your life because of wild food. But I think that's so true is there are a lot of people that do a lot of outdoor activities, whether that's, you know, rock climbing, yeah, biking, hiking. It's hard to emulate, though, the perspective and connection you get when you add wild food foraging into the mix. So yeah, that's that's a fantastic answer. And then the last question, again, is something big and broad in general. And it sounds like you're kind of working in the direction that you want to see here, but what's your greatest hope for our kind of collective, maybe societal or cultural future when it comes to our relationship with wild mushrooms and wild foods? You know, what's kind of the highest aspirations we can have for developing our relationship with wild food? I suppose to pick a kind of a really precise thing is, is to have foraging taught as part of the standard curriculum of all schools. Mm. You know, maybe we should coalesce around that, that, that goal as foragers, you know, you know, cause we are this disparate bunch, but I bet we could all agree on that. Whatever our feelings are, it's like, there should be some, there should be some time for our kids in schools and it should be, it should be on there, you know, maybe that's something we can all kind of coalesce around and there. And I suppose I'm only saying that as just a, a sort of more tenable part of that deeper connection that, that I think is beneficial to everyone. So. Well, we won't expect Mark to lead that effort as well, uh, but I think I think that is a fantastic idea, and I think so many people. Can I just interject there because what, what it was I was listening to another great podcast, not one of yours, but um, another one, and uh, this guy he just started doing communal dinners uh, with forage food, and he just started building it from there. And, what I'd like to do is actually get a class of local kids from our local school and say, like, you know, we're going to do a foraging week where we'll do a little bit every day, maybe after school, and then we'll do a communal meal where we'll all cook a meal for get invited parents along, and uh, just start with that and just build from there. And it's not part of the curriculum, but it's stuff to do with kids. And I think, you know, if we could all reach out to younger people and, and give them that connection, that would be fantastic. I love that idea. It helps build community. I think the number one thing every forager thinks is, why didn't I know about this sooner? So to be able to introduce kids earlier and earlier on to wild food is going to reap fantastic rewards. And I would say that I love the idea of you know communal meals, things outside the school curriculum, but I have been blown away with how receptive uh, now, this may depend on the area you're in. You know, I'm in Marin County here in Northern California. There's already kind of a more alternative, open understanding of these kind of ideas. But school systems have been extraordinarily receptive to the idea of teaching about mushrooms, about getting out in the wild. You know, I was at one of the fungus fairs here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I had a kindergarten teacher who was adamant that I needed to get in there and take kids out foraging. And now this was right before you know, the lockdown and everything. So that didn't happen. But I think that that effort, even if it's in a decentralized manner, I think we'll be impressed by how much that school systems resonate with that kind of idea. I think more and more educators are realizing how important it is to get kids outside and doing something tactile. It'll make them better learners kind of in all phases of their education. So yeah, a fantastic idea that I, I'm certainly going to take on board. Um, funnily enough, I did something with the local forest school and uh, put something up on Instagram and and people, I said, look, you know, please chip in ideas about how to connect kids with fungi because there are sort of challenges, you know. The biggest challenge is most people, most of the people who are normally teaching in teaching positions are terrified of fungi, you know, in a microphobic culture. So, but, you know, really good methods for showing kids how fungi grow and, uh, you know, just the way to do it. And I, I want, I'd actually like to group source, maybe, maybe we could exchange some emails maybe you've got some resources as well and just compile where all that good information because there's loads of good stuff out there put it in a place where people who are taking out you know forest school leaders who are not necessarily very fungally literate but they can go there for a resource about how to safely and engage children with with fungi i think that would be that would be amazing you know an educator that comes to mind is craig trester here in new york city in the united states who actually has successfully taught some classes in the school system there in New York City, which talk about an area that needs more natural connection. Uh, and he's just a fantastic individual who's one of the most passionate, enthusiastic. I think he just came out with a podcast as well on top of everything else. So he'd be a, a great resource that I can connect you with. You know, as someone who may have some ideas, I believe he's already generated his kind of basic curriculum. And another organization that comes to mind is, you may have heard of Juliana Furchi with the Fungi Foundation there in Chile. 
one of her big missions, I know, kind of amidst everything else she's doing, is creating some kind of curriculum. And they just moved their foundation or expanded their reach to here in the United States as well. So another big group with all kinds of, you know, mushroom and fungi warriors, if you will, who want to inoculate the youth. So yeah, I think you're on to a trend there that's probably, you know, not too far off, hopefully, you know, maybe in the next five or 10 years. Don't you just love how, you know, this enthusiasm about fungi, it just spreads just like mycelium, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, in us. it's, it's infected us all and, and, uh, in many ways. And uh, it's, it's wonderful. It's a joke that I always tell people is that you get inoculated, but it's a hundred percent true. You know, once you learn <laughs> yeah. what they can do, you absolutely, your brain gets taken over by the fungi. Well, I see it certainly has with you, Mark, and I just appreciate you sharing this fungal wisdom, but also your wisdom about plants and about kind of coastal foraging. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. And I really, really am excited to follow your work here into the future because I think it's some of the most in-depth work about wild foods and just some of the most exciting work you're doing there in Scotland. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me.